Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone. Erev Tov. Welcome to another live webinar from the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel. I'm Jay Shofit coming to you from Tel Aviv. We have with us tonight uh, Alon Rothschild, SPNI's Director of Biodiversity Policy. He'll be with us in just a minute while, while we wait for people to join. Uh, glad everybody's here this, this evening in Israel or this morning on the west coast of the states and this afternoon on the east coast. Appreciate everybody for being here uh, with us through webinars already on three years of them. Pretty much every couple of weeks we come to you live at this time with uh, our own professionals and people from the environmental movement all over Israel. Special webinar tonight on Tubishvat, as you all know. Erev Tubishvat in Israel, Chag Sameach. Uh, happy Tubishvat to everyone. Hi, Miroslav. Uh, so great to see you here as always. Uh, everybody, please feel free to write to us where you're from in the chat. Uh, really, uh, really glad to see people coming from all over Chicago. Hope to be there this uh, this May. Hi, Dina. Uh, we're looking forward uh, to a busy season here in SPNI. There's just so much going on from every perspective with challenges from our new government and the possible uh, harming of environmental uh, protection from all kinds of ways. Uh, wow, we got lots of people coming in from all over the place. Uh, so great to see you. I want to give a shout out though to our uh, our board members and board chair people in the States and in Canada and in the UK. Thanks everybody for, thank thank you all for dedicating your time and, and uh, efforts uh, to us. Appreciate so much uh, all the support we're getting from uh, from people around the globe. Uh, it is very uh, heartwarming, and especially these times, it's tough times in Israel and uh, not 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 usual times. And uh, particularly from our perspective, there's a lot of challenges to uh, keeping the environment uh, and people safe. Uh, we'll be writing about that, and you'll hear from us this week. Uh, SB and I joined uh, dozens of other environmental organizations in a uh, very uh, serious letter a legal letter written to uh, the heads of the government uh, about the potential environmental damage to policies uh, happening now uh, or that are being proposed. But uh, we're going to be looking at an older issue in Israel today. Wow, something that's been with us a long time. I'd, uh, I'm i going to uh, welcome to our webinar now uh, Alone Rothschild. Alone, as I mentioned, for those of you just joining, and we're up to, wow, over 120 people already and climbing. So. Uh, Alone, we're still joining people. We'll, I'll, 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 I'm introducing you now, but in another minute or so, we'll get going. Um, Alone has been working on this issue for a long time. He has a very broad portfolio in SPNI, and as biodiversity manager, spends a lot of his time protecting our seas and oceans uh, with his staff. And he runs this incredible program called Teva Biz, uh, helping uh, businesses have better business practices towards the preservation of biodiversity in their. Uh, business spheres. Uh, but tonight he's going to be talking about uh, something which he's quite the expert in. He authored a report three years ago, uh, which is linked in the messages we sent you and which you can find online about a forestation policy in Israel. Alone, welcome. Uh, happy to have you here tonight. And uh, I am, I never get tired of this lecture. Uh, we've done it a few times over the years, not, not in two years, but uh, so I think you have a couple updates for us. And what's going on with the forestation policy? We're all eager to hear, and uh, you know it's Tubishva in America, and uh, it's become the holiday of tree. It's it's a holiday of environmental awareness, and it's a holiday of the trees, and it's a holiday where many Jews, well-meaning Jews from around the world, plant trees in Israel through the Karen Cattle Israel JNF, uh, Israel's de facto forestry service, and. Uh, that has been going on for many, many decades and uh, has forested so much of Israel as they're so proud of. But we're here to look today at a, uh, a harder look at what really has gone on and what should be going on in terms of Israel's afforestation. So alone, thank you very, very much. Uh, looking forward to the webinar. Hello, everybody. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Uh, so happy to be here. 
Um, my name is Alon. I, I love trees. I'm named after a tree. It's an oak tree in Hebrew. Uh, but I would like to uh, share with you today the perspective that uh, not necessarily planting trees uh, in Israel is uh, an answer for environment or climate change or a host of other excuses that are used for uh, planting in uh, natural uh, uh, places. Of course, there are places in which we encourage to plant, but uh, we'll take that uh, towards the, the end of the talk. Uh, so let's start by just uh, uh, experiencing a bit of the natural uh, habitats uh, in Israel, which are very beautiful, and some or most of them are not uh, uh, rich in trees. This was a very brief view of the beautiful biodiversity of uh, grasslands and uh, scrublands in Israel, uh, with a few of the of the champions of this uh, of this uh, ecosystem. Uh, and let's now have another glimpse of what uh, is happening uh, in the past few decades, and especially in the past few years in the northern Negev. What you see here is actually afforestation uh, activities done by Kakal. Uh, what you see here, the, all those uh, uh, ramps of, of, uh, of soil are not a way to prevent the Egyptian army from invading Israel or something like that. Uh, it's not an army uh, maneuver. It's actually uh, uh, the, the works for establishing a new uh, forest in a, in a place where forests have never been in the entire evolution. Um, the trees haven't been planted yet in this video, but they are about to be planted. But this is the, the, the earthworks. You can see a tiny, tiny patch of a natural uh, area in the middle, but the rest of the area was just uh, torn apart uh, with heavy machinery. You can see here the marks of the, of the bulldozers. Uh, so that, that's just a glimpse, and we're trying to, to explore now uh, why is this happening? Is it good or is it bad? So uh, this is a natural uh, less plain. Uh, it's a type of habitat called less uh, uh, plain, uh, just uh, uh, east of uh, of Be'er Sheva in the northern Negev. This is what it looks like naturally uh, in the spring. Uh, this is what it looks like after the heavy machinery of uh, of uh, Kakal have uh, started to establish a new forest in this area. And this is what it looks like from uh, very uh, from the uh, the height of a, of a person. Um, this is what it looks like uh, after the forestation have been uh, uh, done. These are uh, this is an uh, uh, an old uh, forest, maybe a few decades ago. Uh, these are eucalyptus uh, trees coming from Australia. You can see this was uh, take this shot was taken in the spring uh, where everything's supposed to be blooming and green in the northern Negev. You can see that uh, there is hardly any green beneath those trees because uh, the leaves of this type, specific type of tree are actually rejecting uh, any germination of uh, natural uh, uh, plants in this area. This is from another part of Israel. It's actually right uh, near the place where I live in uh, the, north, the southern Carmel. You can see here a beautiful scrubland with beautiful uh, blooming of, uh, of uh, plants in the spring. Um, and this is what uh, is done in order to uh, make a, a forest in those uh, Mediterranean uh, areas. You, you can see the heavy machinery uh, digging holes in the ground in order to plant uh, trees inside. Uh, this is what looks like uh, near the Modi'in, if you know the place, in the center of Israel, again, an area 
which is naturally part uh, scrubland, part grassland, part maybe a few uh, scarce trees uh, in, in small patches. And then you can just see all those uh, um, plastic uh, uh, um, uh, things that are uh, um, are put there in order to protect uh, the the new trees. And eventually, after a few years, to, to transform this beautiful uh, grassland into something entirely different ecologically, which is uh, a planted forest. So. Israel, uh, as you know, is a very uh, a unique place in terms of uh, biodiversity, and the majority of the ecosystems in Israel have never been a forest and are not rich in trees. Uh, this includes the Golan Heights with the grassland in the center, uh, the less plains of the northern Negev, uh, the uh, 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 calcareous uh, sandstone in the uh, uh, western Negev and in the uh, coastal plain, uh, uh, grassland, Scrublands, uh, and they host uh, uh, a variety of endemic and uh, and special specialized species, which are not found uh, in an areas where you have a lot of trees. This is uh, the uh, long-legged buzzard, for example. And if you really can see from uh, this, this tail here, it belongs to uh, to a skink, to a type of lizard, uh, and and this uh, type of predator actually can uh, take the prey only on open landscape uh, areas where it has lots of reptiles as a, as a food. This is another type of lizard with no legs, which is uh, again, specializing in, uh, in places where uh, they have uh, 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 hardly any trees uh, uh, over there. If we can look at the map, we can see that actually uh, the type of vegetation is determined a lot by uh, the precipitation and by the geology. So you can see here in uh, brown, the 200 meters precipitation uh, line. Uh, on uh, south of that, uh, it's actually a desert. So uh, in the area of Ofakim, Kiryat Gat, uh, the, the Bika, uh, the Rift Valley, uh, all those areas are actually <laughs> desert in terms of uh, of trees, so there's not supposed to be any trees there. But also in the Mediterranean area, when you have more precipitation, you have lots of uh, uh, areas where the geology determines that you will not have a natural forest. You can see here on yellow, the uh, coastal plain uh, 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 sand dunes on which uh, uh, the, uh, what the, the drops of the, of the rain are just uh, sinking immediately into the uh, uh, ground. So uh, there are hardly any, any uh, uh, water in the ground to sustain trees. You can see here on uh, uh, dark brown, the Golan Heights uh, uh, basalt uh, uh, um, soil, uh, in which, again, uh, there are hardly any trees because of the unique uh, geology and uh, uh, another, uh, another few uh, uh, geological features that do not sustain trees. And what is interesting is to look on three specific uh, uh, afforestation uh, um, plans that uh, we got on the past year. I am a member in the committee that is supposed to uh, decide whether an, a certain area is going to be uh, afforested or not afforested. Uh, I'm a member uh, for, for the SPNI in a broad committee. And on the past year, on 2022, we got three uh, plans for uh, afforestation by Kakal. The first was in a very beautiful place called Karnei Chitim. Maybe you know it. It's the famous battlefield between the Crusaders and Saladin, uh, which on, on at the end of this uh, battle, actually uh, Saladin won and the Crusaders lost. And afterwards, uh, they uh, after a few another years, but they were out of the country uh, for a long time. And on this beautiful area, which is a basalt uh, area, you can see on the, on the background the Mount Hermon with the snow. But on this area, actually, here was the place where uh, the Crusaders uh, uh, ran into, the Karnechi team. Uh, uh, it's a, uh, an extinct uh, volcano. And this is the place, the hill, where the tent of Saladin was actually built. And the direction of the battle was from uh, beneath up. And there was lots of uh, arrows uh, flying around. And this area was never forested with trees. It was never a forest. But Kakal 
came forward uh, in the past year and they wanted to uh, plant a, tr a forest, a new forest on the entire slope of this battlefield, which is not only bad for biodiversity because this is a natural grassland, it's also bad for the historic uh, uh, preservation of this uh, uh, World Her Heritage Site. The second plan that they want to promote is here in the Korazim. It's actually on the uh, northern tip of the uh, Lake of Galilee, of the Kinneret. Uh, it's again a basalt area. It's not supposed to sustain trees. You can see here the, the picture, beautiful grassland with lots of unique birds, and they want to uh, transform it into a forest. And the, uh, the last and uh, third uh, plan, uh, if you can see here a green, very, it's really a, a bit hard to see, but it's a green, tiny patch of a specific, unique uh, geological formation um, called Bar Kokhva uh, geological uh, uh, formation. And again, it's a limestone, but it's, it is not supposed to sustain trees because of the uh, 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 traits of the, of the ground. And this is the picture, beautiful place. And again, they want to transform it into a forest. On this specific uh, 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 case, uh, the first and third uh, plans were uh, at this time uh, rejected, but uh, we are still struggling with them to uh, uh, prevent planting a forest uh, here in the middle <laughs> Korazim area. So over uh, 100,000 hectares already are forested uh, by men in Israel over the past 70, 80 years. Uh, so what's the problem? You can see here, both sides are green. The right-hand side, it's a, a man-made forest. The left-hand side, is a, it's a northern uh, Negev uh, uh, grassland. What's the difference and, and what does it matter? Why don't we at SPNI want the entire area to be a forest? Uh, and uh, maybe the latest uh, excuse to try and uh, plant trees in, uh, in uh, Israel and, and globally is because there was this uh, uh, paper, scientific paper, published uh, two or three years ago uh, in uh, science that uh, claimed that if we're going to plant a lot of trees uh, globally, we can halt climate change and try and, and uh, sustain our planet uh, uh, with, uh, with no, uh, and, uh, with no uh, uh, bad uh, impact of uh, climate change. And this made a lot of noise and the short er uh, version the short answer to this, uh, to this issue is that it's not going to work. Uh, just to show you a few examples of the problem, of the problem with this uh, plan, uh, you can see here the global map of uh, areas where they wanted to plant trees or they, they thought uh, trees can be uh, uh, planted. And uh, let's see a few examples. This is an area that was marked as a, a putative uh, a place for afforestation. It's in uh, Eastern Africa, in uh, Kenya and Tanzania. Maybe you've been there or heard of it. This is the iconic uh, Maasai Mara uh, and uh, Serengeti parks, a savanna, natural grassland, not supposed to be afforested, never have been uh, a forest in the past 6 million years. And they thought it's a good uh, uh, um, idea to plant it with trees in order to mitigate climate change, of course, with uh, harsh uh, uh, consequences for biodiversity in Eastern Africa. This is a, a scientific paper that was a, a reaction to this plan, uh, the trouble with trees, the forestation plans for uh, Africa. And it, it elaborated the, uh, the damage to uh, unique biodiversity living in those uh, savannas. Uh, another uh, uh, plan in uh, the UK, uh, again, to plant trees in order to mitigate climate change. And this uh, scientific paper, again, made the analysis and claimed that uh, 30 to 50 percent of uh, ecologically viable uh, habitats in the UK are going to be lost if those plans are going to be fulfilled. Um, and there are all kinds of other problems. For example, those uh, people in uh, Ethiopia have planted, uh, have uh, donated in order to plant trees and have paid for planting an invasive species coming from Australia called the Acacia saligna. saligna it's a, again a problem also in here in Israel as an invasive species. Uh, so planting trees is not a magic bullet that you can just use wherever you want, however you want in order to, uh, um, to accomplish all kinds of environmental uh, uh, um, goals. 
If we will look at the map uh, of Israel, we're going to see that the putative map of where you, you can uh, make an afforestation, again, are, is comprised of all kinds of interesting areas. This is the Southern Golan Heights, a beautiful grassland. This is a, a, an area called the, uh, uh, the Samek uh, Stream, beautiful area. Uh, which is not supposed to be afforested. Uh, it has gazelles, it has uh, uh, raptors, it is not supposed to be a forest. Uh, this is another place that was marked as a potential uh, um, a forest. These are the, the Nitsanim uh, uh, and Ashdod sand dunes are not supposed to be a forest. They cannot be a forest because there's not enough water over there, but you have a lot of unique biodiversity that is going to be uh, disappearing from the area if you, we will make it a forest. So uh, as a response to this uh, plan to globally plant a lot of trees uh, all over the world in order to mitigate climate change, there was a lot of uh, comment articles that claim that this is uh, just wrong, scientifically speaking. And uh, these are a few of the, of the uh, leading authors uh, um, a leading scientific uh, researchers that claim that uh, this plan to globally plant trees in order to mitigate climate change is, is uh, uh, wrong. And you can see here uh, an article in the New York Times, planting trees will not save the world. And I will describe briefly why not. Just uh, uh, to show you that uh, just uh, three or four months ago, uh, there was another scientific paper published in Science uh, by an Israeli uh, group researchers that claimed uh, that limited climate change mitigation potential through forestation uh, of the vast dryland regions. They basically said, maybe you can plant trees in a few parts of the world, but if you were going to plant trees in, in, to mitigate climate change in dryland uh, uh, regions, this is uh, not going to work. Why? Why uh, climate change in Israel, uh, uh, why forestation is not the answer for climate change in Israel? First of all, it's not practical, and I will elaborate uh, in a few slides uh, uh, in advance, but this is just the highlights. Uh, there's not enough area in Israel to plant uh, uh, trees. First of all, there's not enough water and nutrients. Uh, there is an overestimation fivefold of the potential carbon uh, sequestration of uh, man-made uh, uh, forest uh, in Israel. Uh, there is actually a warming effect outside uh, the tropic areas if you plant a tree, uh, if, uh, plant a forest in a desert area or a dryland area, you actually warm the, the atmosphere. And of course, it is harm, harmful for biodiversity. And maybe the, the worst thing, planting trees uh, as a, the sole solution for climate change is just an illusion. And it gives policymakers the uh, easy way out from painful solutions like uh, cutting down emissions. Uh, so, uh, in Israel, uh, the global models uh, uh, claim that there are, there, there are 120,000 hectares that are potentially suitable for planting trees, which is 0.01% uh, of global potential to mitigate climate change. But we took those global models and we uh, checked them in Israel. Uh, where do they, uh, where, where, where are these areas? So you can see, uh, first of all, that vast areas were marked in the Judean desert. No tree, no forest is going to uh, uh, sustain to, to live in, uh, over there because it's, it's an extreme desert. First of, uh, and second of all, if you look at the uh, distribution of the areas that were potentially a forest, you can see that uh, some of them, 17%, were actually uh, built areas. 16% are agriculture, and you know, it's, it's no, there's no logic to take a, a, a farmland and to take it, uh, to turn it into a forest where it actually feeds us. Uh, some of the areas were already forest, uh, so some were a, a nature reserve. So you end up with 11% of the potential area, which maybe can be planted as a forest, but, the majority of those uh, area were between 200 and 300 uh, um, millimeters uh, of rainfall each year, which is actually semi-arid and cannot be a, a forest if you look at climate change uh, projections. So you left with 4% of the uh, potential area, 
which is actually what we left, what, what is left of the beautiful grasslands and, uh, and uh, uh, scrublands of Israel, which we want to uh, preserve for biodiversity. So you are left at the end of maybe, in Israel, maybe 0.0004% of the global potential to mitigate climate change if you plant all those empty areas with a forest, and of course, it's just uh, uh, no use. Um, second of all, uh, uh, in terms of, of the beautiful areas that they want to forest, this is the Hatserim area in the northern Negev. It's a beautiful less plain uh, with lots of biodiversity. This is the, the beautiful uh, uh, Eastern Galilee uh, uh, scrublands, uh, which again, are, uh, they sustain uh, 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 very uh, sensitive biodiversity, and we just don't want to see uh, a forest over there. This is the less plains. Uh, and again, the, the, main, uh, the, the, the second main problem is that uh, there's not enough, sorry about that, uh, uh, the arid line is going to move north. So a lot of the areas which now you think that you can plant over there and you have enough rainfall are not going to be uh, able to sustain a forest in let's say 10 or 20 years because climate change is going to affect and the arid line is going to move north. Uh, this is a projection of the precipitation decrease, uh, et cetera. I'm going to go over that. Um, but on the contrary, where trees are actually dying, man-made trees, uh, <clears throat> man-planted trees are actually dying in the, in the cacal forest, the natural Mediterranean vegetation is actually more resilient to climate change. And this is a, an Israeli uh, uh, research that found that the Middle Eastern natural plant communities <coughs> like uh, uh, shrubs can actually tolerate nine uh, straight years of drought uh, because they have been evolving uh, in this area and they can actually, uh, um, they are more resilient to droughts. So this is the vegetation that you want to see here and not uh, um, uh, planted uh, uh, forest. Alone, excuse me one second. I just want to, there's a few questions. Just to explain to everybody that Kakal is the Karen Kamal Israel. Uh, it's translated as JNF, and it's usually written in English uh, when it's talked about as KKL slash JNF. Uh, and it is the uh, de facto forestry service of Israel. It operates under a special charter with the government of Israel and has been since the pre state era, since the early, very early uh, 20th century or before, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so anyway, just to clear that up for everybody. So whenever he said, alone mentions Kakal, he's talking about the, the people that are planning, the, the organization that is planning the, for these forests. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Actually, the, the whole legal uh, uh, issue of Kakal is very complicated, so I didn't want to get into that in this short talk, but uh, we can get into that if you want on the, uh, at the end of the talk. Um, so uh, uh, basically, uh, there's an, a, a wrong notion that grasslands are actually empty areas in terms of uh, carbon. For example, if you look at the left-hand side uh, picture, it's from the Tavo uh, area, beautiful area that, again, uh, Kakal, JNF wanted to plant a forest over there. And, and they said, well, there's nothing there, and we want to plant trees in order to uh, sequester carbon from the atmosphere and then put it in the ground. So grasslands can store a lot of carbon, but they do it below ground not above ground like a tree, below ground on the roots. Uh, so it has, grasslands have a lot of potential in terms of climate change mitigation. Uh, and this is actually a, a research paper from California, which as you know better than me, uh, has lots of uh, problems with uh, fires and is actually quite similar to, to the situation in Israel in terms of uh, weather and, and uh, the conditions. And they claim, those researchers claim, that grasslands in California may be more reliable carbon sinks than forests, because forests, unfortunately, tend to just burn every few years. And as you know, in Israel, we have a lot of uh, forest fires uh, as well. So if you put the carbon on the roots uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a grassland, it may be a better uh, storage for the carbon uh, than a forest. Uh, and then it stays in the ground and not uh, uh, emitted to the atmosphere if you have a wildfire. Um, 
Well, this is a very uh, brief point, but basically when somebody says, well, let's plant a forest in order to mitigate climate change, it cannot be a cloud forest or a rainforest like we know or heard of in the David Attenborough films of if you are fortunate enough to visit Costa Rica or Africa or other areas. Men cannot imitate the complex structure of a, of a rainforest. And usually on most places you can, there's not enough water and the conditions are not suitable for planting a, a rainforest, which can be thousands of years old. So usually it's a man-made plantation and a man-made plantation cannot sequester carbon on the same rate and quantities like a natural uh, uh, rainforest. And this is from a scientific paper, but basically what, that's what it says that uh, um, um, that the carbon sequestration rate in man-made forests is slower 40-fold uh, in contrary to tropical natural uh, forests. Um, and of course, a managed plantation or a planted forest releases a lot of carbon uh, through thinning out action actions. Uh, the cacal, uh, JNF, they come to the forest, to the man-made forest every 20, 30 years and they cut down a lot of the trees because they are too dense. So they want to, uh, to give the, the, the mature trees more space. So they cut down a lot of the trees, which is fine in terms of biodiversity, but the carbon is getting out of the forest again. Um, and maybe the, the most complex uh, point, but it's very uh, uh, important. So just bear with me for a second. I'm sure that you are familiar with the uh, with the experience of walking in a very hot uh, desert area with a uh, black t-shirt. And I'm sure you will remember the sense of heat that you have when the uh, rays of sun uh, hit the black uh, uh, t-shirt and then the light is actually, the, the sunlight is actually transformed into heat radiation. That's exactly what happens if you take a natural desert area like this uh, area in the northern uh, Negev in Israel, and you plant a dark green patch of a forest in this area. So what happens is that the natural uh, uh, environment, which is very light colored, takes the majority of the uh, sunlight uh, uh, and transforms it back to the atmosphere as a sunlight uh, 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 radiation, which is not heat. But when the sun rays hit the dark patch of the forest, the majority transforms into heat radiation. So what you have is actually heating the climate and not cooling it. But on the other hand, you would say uh, rightfully that the trees actually sequester also uh, uh, carbon dioxide. And that's a good thing for the environment, for the climate. So what's the balance? And it turns out that uh, it has been calculated. And in the Yatir planted forest, it will achieve at least 80 years after planting the forest in order to achieve a net cooling effect on the, uh, on the climate. And this is not all the things that I show you here in this talk are not my uh, data. It's not my research. It's all been published by other people in scientific uh, uh, papers. So if you plant now a new forest in the Northern Negev, you may expect maybe in 80 years time uh, towards the end of the, of the century to maybe have a net cooling effect on the uh, climate, uh, probably more than 80 years. Uh, recent calculations even indicate a, a century. And like I said, the worst uh, uh, impact is actually on public opinion and on policymakers. This, what you see here, maybe you remember or saw it in the news a few years back, President Macron, the French president, decided to put a tax on fuels in order to make fuel, fossil fuels more expensive and then to have an, a negative incentive for uh, uh, industries and for people to use fuels and then they will uh, uh, have uh, less uh, 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 fossil fuel uh, emissions. And this has led, this was very unpopular move, uh, and this has led to a very uh, uh, broad protest in French. And of course, the tax has been uh, uh, canceled. But if you come to uh, uh, a typical politician and you said, look, you can do the right thing, and the, but the hard thing, and put 
taxes on fossil fuels and make the industry uh, uh, hard life and try to persuade people not to fly as much or or not to drive in uh, let, let's say uh, invest in uh, in public transportation versus uh, 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 private cars it's all very complicated political moves and on the other hand you could just plant a forest and everything's going to be fine every who, who is against the forest it's everybody loves forests right so what happens now is that policymakers get the easy way out which is not going to help us in saving the planet because the uh, um, real real actions that we have to take are very politically uh, complicated uh, and not uh, not popular but these are the only things that can happen that can uh, enable us to uh, uh, save the planet and the climate and these are to reduce drastically uh, fossil fuel emissions and to move to renewable energies and maybe the last point, uh, if you have uh, a, a few uh, last uh, uh, minutes of, of, uh, of uh, patience, is to a little bit elaborate why planting forests in natural areas is so damaging to biodiversity. Again, what you see here in this beautiful picture is a natural grassland in the Tavo area in the, the Galilee of uh, Israel, where uh, a forest has been uh, 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 planned. And we have been able to uh, reduce uh, the, the damage, but not to eliminate it uh, entirely. Um, so as you know, Israel is a biodiversity hotspot. Uh, you can see here alongside with the Madagascar and the Amazonas and the New Zealand, uh, other areas, California. Uh, and like I said, a lot of the ecosystems in Israel are not naturally uh, forests. Uh, we've been through that. And basically, What's, ha what's happening when you plant a forest uh, is maybe you put, you, uh, you add a few species which are typical to forests, but you lose the uh, specialist species that are, have, has been evolving to, uh, to uh, adapt themselves to an area with, which is not uh, rich in trees. So these are, uh, this is a summary of impacts ecological impacts of uh, planting uh, uh, trees in natural habitats in Israel. But basically what you have is a, a large array of, of uh, negative impacts, displacement of shrubland specialist birds, like this uh, beautiful pipit, which is nesting on the ground. And if you put a tree above it and you have a falcon or a, or a raven standing on those trees, it just preys on, uh, on the eggs of this, uh, of this bird, which is nesting on the ground you have a displacement of birds of prey has, which have been in, evolving to uh, specialize in, uh, in hunting on open areas and not in forests. You have uh, an extinction of uh, specific uh, reptiles like this beautiful endemic species of, of uh, a lizard called the Be'er Sheva, fringe-fingered lizard, which is endemic to the northern Negev and is just being uh, uh, disappearing from every spot that a forest has been uh, planted over there. You have exclusion of open area mammals. You have changes in ant, spider, and scorpion communities, and decrease in uh, herbaceous uh, species richness. It is all been documented on scientific uh, uh, research. Um, so I will just go over this very briefly, but I just want you to. Uh, know that it's all uh, been elaborated in the report that I have uh, uh, published a few years ago, but basically on the Northern Negev, uh, it has been documented that uh, uh, birds are uh, being uh, uh, damaged from uh, planting a forest in the Northern Negev in Israel, in the uh, semi steppe shrubland in Israel, and in the Mediterranean shrubland in Israel, in all the major ecosystems. This is, by the way, another uh, nest of a ground uh, nesting bird. You can see here the chicks and they are being just eaten if you have a tree above, of, above the nest with a, uh, with a, a crow stand, uh, standing on. Uh, in terms of uh, birds, again, uh, maybe you're familiar with the beautiful uh, um, uh, project of the online cameras in bird's nest. So the um, short-old eagle and the uh, long-legged buzzard which are documented on the uh, live cameras, they prey on 
uh, uh, grassland and shrubland species of reptiles or, or uh, other uh, insects uh, and, uh, and uh, lizards. And they need these open areas, not forested areas, in order to uh, sustain their chicks uh, on a, uh, a typical uh, uh, breeding uh, season. Uh, this uh, this uh, um, uh, buzzard is, uh, is consuming 260 prey individuals to feed uh, its chicks, and the uh, uh, short throat eagle preys on 215 prey individuals per season to sustain its chick. You can see here the snake. So they are going to work. They, in order to sustain the chicks, they're going to work on the grasslands and on the shrubland, not on the forest. They cannot hunt on the forest. This is about, this is about the damage to uh, reptiles. I'm going to go over that in all the, on the ecosystems in Israel. This is a, a, of a damage to butterflies if you plant a forest uh, in, in uh, some of the ecosystems in uh, Israel. Uh, this is uh, about, uh, uh, I think it's uh, spiders uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, wild bees. But the bottom line is afforestation in natural areas is just a damage to the natural ecosystem and to natural uh, biodiversity. And keep in mind, just uh, uh, one final thing, keep in mind that those negative uh, effects actually are not stays inside the borders of the planet forest. It goes outside of the natural area. For example, um, jays, the bird, not, not jay chauffet, but uh, jays, uh, the bird, they uh, tend to uh, uh, live in the forest, but they go out to uh, almost a mile outside and feed on natural uh, 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 grassland uh, uh, animals and then come, goes back to the forest. I'm going to go over that. So the bottom line is that dozens of thousands of hectares of natural beautiful areas can be saved and not trans be transformed into a man-made forest. Uh, these areas like this and this and this, these are all beautiful natural uh, ecosystems in Israel, which is, should be uh, uh, remain as, as such. So what is the bottom line of what we suggest? Recreation in uh, Forest is a great thing. We have a lot of planted forests in Israel. We can develop more picnic areas, but there's no need to plant uh, new areas in the natural uh, uh, habitat in order to sustain recreation. Uh, so the planted forest should be for recreation. The natural areas should, should be kept as such for biodiversity and also for hiking and, and other activities. And the time for change is now. We don't have a lot of the time. Uh, you are welcome to uh, check out the uh, report. It is online uh, in uh, English as well. Um, and again, our recommendations are to protect existing forests in Israel, to restore natural forests in the tropics, not in Israel, in the tropics and subtropics, because over there it can be made uh, to, to uh, uh, be uh, accustomed to uh, mitigate climate change, not in semi-arid areas like uh, Israel. Uh, of course, prevent wildfires because they create a lot of uh, uh, carbon emissions. And uh, the hardest thing, reduce emissions, fly less, drive less, buy less, and stop novel uh, and new uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, uh, development uh, globally and also uh, in Israel. And of course, protect natural ecosystems uh, by transforming them into natural nature uh, reserves. Um, that's it. Just to show you, there's a lot to be done in uh, in order to sustain natural uh, areas. This is in the northern Negev, beautiful area inside Hatserim Air Base, um, and we have a beautiful project over there with the uh, uh, local uh, uh, pilot uh, academy. Uh, that uh, they are observing uh, the natural uh, birds over there, and then they clean uh, garbage uh, from the uh, natural areas in the base, and they help. These are all uh, cadets of, uh, of uh, uh, pilot cadets, and uh, uh, they help us uh, maintain natural environment with no planting of trees where they don't belong. So I hope I didn't uh, tire you uh, too much with lots of details. Uh, and I'll be happy to take some questions.
Yes. Hi, alone. So lots of questions from the people. And I'll just, I mean, I'll, I'll frame a few of them. Please give everybody a little historical background on how it is that JNF Cacao, both how is it that they plant for us? What, what made them decide to plant for us? And how do they still do it legally today? And the to follow, and somebody else asked, have we had any effect on them? Has SPNI had any effect on them? How much do they realize what they're doing has been wrong? Wow, this is uh, you know for another hour, but uh, very briefly. I'm happy know, to do that for another hour. By the way, let's <laughs> let's let's do that sometime. Yeah. Uh, very briefly, you know, as you know, the JNF Cacal uh, has been established in order to uh, purchase uh, land uh, in the uh, in the country of Israel in order to 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 uh, establish a, a Jewish uh, uh, Zionist. Uh, 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 country uh, and they have succeeded and we have now from since 1948 we have uh, we have a country of our own so the huge organization organization of, of Kakal which has been uh, uh, adapted to uh, uh, purchasing land had to find another job because you know you're not going to just dis dismantle this organization and send people to to do other stuff and then they thought and they thought, and then they came to agreement with the Israeli government. It was in 1950, I think, that the areas, the, the entire uh, uh, land, in, uh, including Kakal purchased lands, are going to be uh, managed by the government, by the Israeli land authority. And Kakal is going to be in charge of afforestation. So they, they got some kind of a job, okay, in order to sustain their, their, their organization. Uh, on the early days, they also drained the Hula wetlands, uh, and that's another story. But uh, ever since then, the, that's what they have been doing. And the excuses has been different every decade. In the 30s, it was jobs for immigrants. On the 50s, it was a way to sustain uh, um, uh, Ribonut, uh, uh, yeah, uh, in order on on, on uh, to sustain uh, Israeli, uh, so, uh, how did you call Sovereign, it? Sovereignty on the land, yeah. Yeah, sovereignty on the land. On the seventies, it was recreation, and now it's climate change. What the, the it's always the same. It's planting trees. It's true. They used to plant more pines. Now they plant more broadleaf, but it doesn't change the ma the major uh, problem. A second about what you ask for. Basically, uh, there there's been a lot of change. Uh, in 20 years ago, there was an appeal to the high court, not by us, and it uh, made them um, file a very specific plan, planting request. And these are judged by the planning committees, and I'm a member of one of those committees. So it's better now. But uh, two decades ago, they have found a new platform that they are planting trees with no plans, no uh, uh, um, public uh, um, oversight over that in order to maintain government lands uh, from, from Bedouins, basically. We have filed, uh, to make a very long story short, on 2015, we have filed a petition to the high court and said that this is uh, not legal what the outcome was that uh, there was another committee established on which we are not members, but there is the Ministry of Environment and the Nature and Parks Authority. So the damage on those uh, planting roots uh, is um, much uh, better. I, I mean, it's much less, the, the oversight is much better, but still not uh, perfect. Basically, that's the story in 60 seconds. It's quite complicated, I'm sorry. It really is, and I, I really wish we, we, maybe we really should talk about it more because it's really a crucial issue that touches on a lot of Israel's environmental issues uh, within within Qatar. Um, I would just add to that, by the way, in terms of the original, why were they planting trees? Uh, Misa Burichevsky, an early Zionist around the turn of the century, had a famous quote, uh, which said, a dumb ain't no af tavnit nof balagato, a man is none but the uh, patterns of the landscapes of his youth. And when the European settlers, uh, you know, came to Israel in the early Zionist years, they thought they wanted pine forests. 
And that is why we have pine forests uh, today. Um, yes, uh, so that's right. And I'll point this out. Jane asked, so again, it's another very complicated part is that be because of all kinds of reasons, JNF around the world, most JNFs around the world, Jewish National Funds locally, uh, disconnected from Kakal in many legal ways. And JNF in the United States, as somebody just pointed out, and I will be the first to say, they do so many things positive in Israel other than the forests. And I would say that they're they are fairly disingenuous about their forestry policies. Um, and, and they claim that uh, it seems like only a few percentage of the money they raise in the States actually goes to Kakao. But Kakao doesn't have to worry because Kakao is actually, and we should mention this alone, it's essentially a real estate development corporation that owns 13% of the land of Israel and it leases that land for development, not for trees. I mean, it, it's a small part of its land to plants trees, but it leases its land to cities and municipalities and, and businesses and uh and uh, it has incomes of billions of shekels a year. So raising money for cacao to plant trees is one of the more absurd things that actually happens in this in this world that we live in. Uh, but JNF does a lot of other great stuff, yes. Uh, and also cacao says, if you, you know, I, I've been reading their fine print, they, they raise money in English now. In their fine print about the Jerusalem forest fires last summer, they say that, you know, they, they say, help us uh, sustain the Jerusalem forest. And then when your fine print it reads, our professionals will let the land regenerate naturally. In other words, they even realize they're not even going to replant that. They're going to let it regenerate, and they don't even admit that they're not planting trees anymore in some ways. Jay, I just, I think, uh, I just want to stress that, you know, this is not about fighting over resources or donations. And, you know, like of course people not, have of course noted, not, but... Kakal are doing great things. They have an amazing network of... Uh, of uh, of a bike, uh, uh, of outdoor bike uh, uh, trails in the forest, and they're doing a lot of nice stuff. It's not about fighting over resources. We just say that in terms of plantations, man-made plantations on natural areas, this is wrong on every aspect. And if you want to do something positive, plant a tree. I think I saw in the chat somebody writes it. Plant a tree in your neighborhood. Plant a tree in the city. It has a, a micro cooling effect, it provides shade, it's great, not on natural areas. Right, but that's what, but alone, and it's slightly correct you, this webinar is a little bit about resources, and it really pains, and, and you know, you more than most professionals in SPNI are aware of the role of philanthropy can and must play in resource development, in, in, in nature protection, and so it just pains us, environmentalists in the field, to see so much money going to kind of knee-jerk tree planting in Israel when we are offering now people um, uh, on our donation links to plant mindfully the way you talk about. We in SPNI we encourage tree planting in um, in in the cities right now for shade. We don't actually do it, but in our birding habitats and in our wetlands that we're rewilding. We didn't talk about wetland habitats so much in Israel on this webinar, but we're re rewilding wetland habitats, and we'll be planting a few trees and shrubs, natural vegetation. It has a function in these ecosystems but not a forest station. Uh, tree, tree planting per se, an individual tree or a little group of trees uh, for a specific purpose, we're not against, but uh, we, and we, you know, we're trying to raise money to do that as well. Um, specifically about Kaka, somebody asked, and it was in the news, I think recently, the Holocaust, where, where Yad Vashem is, that the forest around Yad Vashem, what, are, they, are they pine trees? Are they the right kind of trees or? It's pine trees, but you know, it's I'm I'm not sure on what uh, year it has been planted, but probably you know a few decades ago. So we're not saying anything about you know current uh, uh, plantations. It's fine, especially yeah. around the city. It has its functions, you know, socially. That's fine. Don't touch those trees. Don't burn them. Don't cut them down. Nothing like that. We're just saying that now there are so many challenges in order to. Sustain sustainability in a whole and sustaining uh, natural uh, uh, habitats in Israel. We don't need another, like you said, Jay, we have so many challenges. We don't need another one fighting. I have a lot of things to do on my time in uh, working for, for biodiversity. I don't have to invest a few uh, days in, in uh, every month fighting cacal. It's just a waste of my time uh, because we can try and do something positive. But you know, this. this such a fixation over there. And I showed you a few of the examples from just from 2022 
of trying yeah. to, to put trees where it just doesn't belong. Um, okay, uh, here's, here's a question related to this. Um, somebody writes that they heard, and I, we've all heard, I think, that it was the auto, there used to be forests in Israel, but the Ottoman cut them down, the Ottoman cut, the regime cut them down for railroads. What is the story of historical forests? Because there are some old growth forests in Israel. So tell us about what forests there were and what did the Ottoman do, Ottomans do and why do we think that? Is that another Kakal uh, myth? Well, first of all, I would just, I will address your, your uh, question. I will just say that at the bottom line on 2023, it's not relevant because 2000 years ago or 1500 years ago on the Byzantine uh, era, the entire area of the Middle East was much cooler and with a lot of precipitation. And you maybe you know uh, the ancient uh, uh, agricultural developments in uh, the Negev of that, all the Nabatian, uh, you, you could find uh, uh, groves over there of, of uh, grape, uh, grape uh, uh, vineyards. But it's 1500 years ago where you used to have more rain. So when you look now, to the future, it's not really re relevant what was uh, in the past, but I will uh, address your uh, question. So uh, on a few areas in Israel, like the Sharon, uh, the coastal plain of the Sharon, there was uh, a, a natural uh, um, forest of uh, oak trees of Alon Tavor. And, and a lot of those were cut down by the Ottoman, not just for the railroad, you know, just for a uh, firewood and et cetera, but on the Northern Negev, on the Golan Heights, on uh, Eastern Galilee, where you have the basalt uh, 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 area on, if you know the mountain of Tzfat, uh, Mount Knan, those are geological features which cannot sustain and never could sustain uh, a, a forest. Um, and there were pine trees in Israel, but very, on very few uh, places. You had some in near the Jerusalem in the Masrek Reserve. You have a few on the uh, on the uh, uh, on the Carmel area, but you never had pine forests like in Finland or in Poland. Like uh, the the the, fa the father of our forestation uh, in Israel, Yosef Witz, he uh, immigrated from Poland. And he wanted to see these same views. You know, he was a visionary. He had, you know, he, he, he has done amazing things, but wrong. Um, so are those the old growth forests that do exist, are they in reserves now? Are we working to protect them? Are they important habitats that uh, we're protecting? Yeah, they are. It's not really a forest. It's actually more of a, it's called maki. It's like a dense, uh, low, low height uh, um, tre uh, trees of Mediterranean broadleaves. Uh, it's called Choresh in, in Hebrew. It's not really a forest. You don't really have, yeah, it's not really, you don't really have forest in Israel like what you imagine when, when, when you say a forest. But yeah, those, those habitats are basically protected. You have a very big uh, reserve in the Carmel. You have a very big reserve in the Alonim, in the Southern Galilee. Uh, so the, so uh, the, the, the areas that really lack protection are the, the grasslands, the, the scrublands, uh, desert areas. Great, thank you. We're, one last question here, which I'm curious about as well, because it's been getting some press recently. The green belt across the Sahel to surround the Sahara Desert with a green belt. Is that something that you're, that, you know, is that harmful like everything else you're talking about or is that a good idea? Well, I, I'm not uh, really deep into the, the, the data over there, but basically uh, the, basic pro the basic problems of afforestation in, uh, as a mean to mitigate climate change are, are the same. Uh, it's not like you have, if you've seen the, the movie or, the, or read the book, uh, um, 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 no, by Mi uh, Michael Ande, uh, uh, I will get to the name. Uh, you, you don't have this great nothingness of desert, you know, just moving and you have to have a belt to stop it. It just doesn't work like that. Uh, so so uh, uh, the basic uh, problems are there. 
it's not really going to create the effect, the, the enormous effect of carbon sequestration that is going to save the planet. It gives people the easy way out. In, uh, you know, you have donors uh, flying in and out uh, of places, you know, em emitting in, with private uh, jet planes, uh, going to conferences about climate change and donating to planting trees. It just doesn't work. You have to stop emissions in order to do that. Uh, yeah. And also, in terms of uh, local local livelihoods, maybe the, the the trees are going to be there. I'm not sure it's, if it's going to be uh, sustainable in terms of water and nutrients. You know, it's it's not plastic. Those are living organisms. They have to have the basic uh, uh, conditions to to be sustainable. So basically, uh, what from what I've read, it's not really the um, magic uh, solution to climate change. Uh, it's a bit uh, colonialistic, maybe even, you know? I hear you, I agree. Alone, this is fascinating. I wish we could stay longer. We're already over the hour, something we usually don't do. There's still 150 people with us. Uh, so we really, really appreciate it. Uh, it was a fascinating, uh, a fascinating talk and sobering. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of optimism as well. A lot of people asking, they're saying they had no idea and what can they do to get this word out. I mean, we're trying the way the best we can, but all feeling individual communities, even if it's talking to individuals about this issue, and you know, especially around Tubishva when everybody just gets all excited because of the trees. Uh, but it's not always trees, they're not in the right places. You have to, you can't don't plant any tree in Israel. That's that's my mind. Just plant a few very specific trees. And uh, alone, thank you very much, really. And I will, I will talk to you. I think the uh, uh, webinar about the uh, governance issues of the forest with JNF, uh, you know, unrelated to what they do or don't do uh, by, you know, ecologically, I think is uh, an interesting issue for us as well. Let's so maybe... uh, may make a deal. The w next one is going to be on the deep sea because I have lots of needs over there. And afterwards, uh, another one of Kakal. Absolutely, we'll do that. And we love uh, <laughs> you know, sitting in front of your home aquarium, I guess. Uh, it's uh, it's beautiful. And we will definitely do something on the deep sea. I assume that's what you spend most of your time doing since, since it is the blue half of Israel. And uh, it's got to be at least half your job, so. All right. Well, thank you very much alone. Thank you, David Amichai, uh, on vacation doing this back office from Ein Bokek at the Dead Sea. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, Yom Oled Sameach, David. Uh, it was recorded and this will be published probably tomorrow online. Uh, you'll have uh, links to upcoming webinars. So thank you very, very much, everybody. Signing off. Chag Sameach. Chag Tubish Fat Sameach. Bye-bye.